When it comes to purchasing metal sheet and coil for your business, there's a lot of suppliers you can choose from. But it might not always be wise to choose the lowest cost supplier for a variety of reasons. We're going to discuss some of those today. What's up guys? Welcome to the Metal Roofing Channel and welcome to Q&A Mondays. I'm Thad Barnett. Make sure you subscribe if you're new. We release metal roofing and metal construction content every Monday and Wednesday. All the questions that we discuss are in the description down below. You can jump ahead using those quick links. Today we are discussing some problems that you can run into when it comes to choosing a low cost metal supplier, whether it be bad materials, cutting corners, uh, low quality paint. There's a lot of different things that can cause that price to be low and then offer a lower quality as well. So I have Jeff Hawk and Adam Mazzella from Sheffield Metals with us today. Guys, thanks for being here. Talk to me about metal quality. You know, why is that a problem? You know, if metal is a low is a little bit lower quality than normal and how would that affect a uh, metal fabrication business or metal roofing business? Yeah, Thad, thanks for having us. Um, you know, and I, I think in our world, it's not so much, it's it's a lot of, you know, low grade, bad quality steel. It's, it's probably lending itself more towards, you know, the right grade of steel for the right application. So, you know, if you're talking standing seam metal roofing, you're going to predominantly see that sweet spot be in the grade 50, 50,000 plus KSI range, but not too high. If you get too high, you're in the grade 80 range. That's really what you're seeing for the face fastened panel world or ag type panel world. Steel that, that's that hard uh, really is difficult to roll form. Now, if you're going on the lighter end, so like the 33,000 KSI world, your CS type B grade steels, you're really looking at gutter type materials. So it may look like a duck, it might walk like a duck, but it's not the real deal. So you could have potential roll forming issues with that lower grade steel or even that higher grade steel. It really is about that kind of sweet spot, you know, grade 50 in between. That's really where you're going to be able to see your engineered systems. And, and Jeff can allude to what happens when you don't have the right quality material for that. Just going off of what Adam's talking about as far as the steel is concerned, you know, we're talking about different grades. It's also the gauge of your steel as well. Typically with standing seam roofing, you're going to see, you know, it's going to be predominantly 24 gauge, some in 26. But you start getting into the lighter gauge steels that are less expensive, more cost effective, whatever you want to word it. It doesn't mean they're going to be appropriate for the standing seam world or the, or the application that you're using them on. So as far as product quality goes in steel grades, you know, you want to make sure you're using the proper material, the proper gauge, proper grade uh, for the application that you're going to be, you know, installing with. What about paint system when it comes to choosing a metal supplier? What should we be looking for there? So paint systems, you know, obviously the top of the line is going to be your PVDF paint systems and they're going to come at a premium. Uh, the warranties are better. The chalking and fading ratings on them are better. You know, so they're going to come at a higher cost. You know, you get into siliconized polyester, SMP paint systems, things like that. It's a it's a very popular paint color. It depends on what type of application you're looking for. They usually come with the same or close to the same year warranty, but the stipulations of that warranty are going to be less than what you're going to find in a PVDF system. Uh, the chalking is going to be more. The fading is going to be more. Things like that. So again, it's kind of like that good, better, best when you're looking at the quality of items, PVDF being the best, SMP, siliconized polyester being the good or better. And it's easy to let somebody say, hey, you know, this warranty is just as long as PVDF or pretty close, but you got to take a look and, and read into those details a little bit more. Make sure you understand what's actually being covered with that duration. Right. And, and also how you're going to be installing it. You know, if this is going to be your forever home and you want it to look like the day it did when it was built, you're going to probably want to invest a little bit more and get that best quality paint system. Commercial building owner of a warehouse or something like that at SMV might do you just fine. Even if you're looking at it from the, the manufacturer or contracting level, you know, I think you got to look at it as, you know, good, better, best. You know, your traditional polyester system is what you're going to see for like roof flashing, you know, on, on a you know shingle roof. So what you're going to put in your valley, what you're going to put on your drip edge, it's really not going to be seen very much. You start to see some uh, gutter systems using polyester as well as siliconized polyester. You also see siliconized polyester in ag panel type applications. So it's a great paint technology. 
But again, it's not going to be as vibrant as as long, you know, long lasting as a PVDF type system. In terms of that, you know, you might say, hey, day one, dark bronze is dark bronze, but what's it really going to mean to your customer five years down the line, 10 years down the line? To me, you wanna you wanna be always pushing. If you're pushing a, a premium product in standing seam probably want to be pushing, you know, the the premium product top to bottom, whether it's from the substrate being the steel or aluminum or the paint finish uh, being a PVDF. You know, another reason that metal can be a little bit lower uh, cost is when it comes to testing standards and engineering. Tell me about, you know, when engineering requirements might be inconsistent or the material might not adhere to testing standards or a supplier might not even offer testing. Well, I think a lot of times the end user isn't aware of the testing that's available or could be available for the roof that they're getting. You know, if you live in certain places like Florida or Texas and things like that, you know, you might be more aware of them, but at the same time, you might not really know what you need. You just know you need something. So obviously when it comes to testing, uh, number one, that's a cost when it comes down to it. But more importantly, the components and accessories in the system are going to be maybe for lack of better words, a higher level. You might be able to use a fixed clip to get by normally, which is cheaper than expansion clip that's used in your engineered system. Um, Also, a lot of times you're going to see your clip spacing is going to be significantly closer together than in systems that aren't tested. Uh, So again, those raise costs because you're having to buy more components to put the system on with. You know, a lot of times an engineered system is going to be more expensive just for that fact alone. You know, the products used in it, obviously you want to get the best test results you can. You're going to use the best materials, things like, you know, if your clips are closer, you have more fasteners. So everything kind of goes hand in hand with becoming a more uh, expensive system. And, you know, one thing that I think that not everybody considers when it comes to offering engineering or or installing engineered systems as a contractor is you're not only protecting your your client's roof, your client's properties, but you're protecting yourself as a contractor too because now you're installing something that has been tested and you can say, "Hey, you know, th- this is these systems are tested. They have engineering to back them up so that you as an installer are now protected as well." Absolutely correct. Um you know, when, when you're just talking about total cost of the project whatsoever, your cost of your system might go up and you need engineering because of your decking. You know, you might have decking that's not appropriate for the for the installation of a standing seam roof. Uh, so now, you know, you should really have your decking replaced. So it really depends on the system that's being installed, what requirements you have to meet and what you're working with on your existing building. You know, if it's new construction, it's probably not that big of a deal because you can specify this stuff as you're going. But for a replacement roof, you know, you have to verify everything that you have in place. Yeah, additionally, and, and Jeff, I, I would kind of pile on that and say, you know, there's there's a lot of people that have piggyback engineering. And, you know, what that is, is they say a roll former or a profile has a UL90 on it. That is simply a construction number. That does not equate to engineering. You got to be clear when somebody says, oh yeah, I got a UL90 on it. Well, do you have a UL90 construction number or do you actually have, you know, UL90 engineering? Did you complete a UL580 test to get that UL90 ratings? I think one thing to be cognizant of is, you know, do you really have engineering or is it just a piggyback, which is very common in the metal roofing industry as well? So another thing, when we talk about an engineered system, we're talking about a fully engineered system, not just an uplift test or a UL90 rating. Engineered system to Sheffield is a UL580-1897 uplift test that we actually test in the laboratory. It's water penetration, it's air infiltration, it's submersion testing if applicable, it's hail uh, impact, it's fire ratings. A lot of times when you hear about engineering, you'll hear about UL90 construction numbers or piggybacked engineering. Basically, if you have a roll former that produces a profile that has a construction number, you can basically pay for that UL90 construction number, and now you can say, I have engineering. It doesn't have a raised seal. People that have the construction number in their name didn't actually physically go test it. It is basically the minimum requirement of what we consider uplift engineering is a UL90 uh, rating. So uh, there's, there's different thoughts on what engineered is versus, you know, what people can claim to be engineered. Yeah, and, and I would argue that that's not engineering. That's just taking something somebody already did and saying, hey, look, I have uplift. There isn't 
a generic UL for water penetration, water submersion, air infiltration, those types of things too. So that really is what it's all about is the engineered system. It's not just an, an uplift component to it. Is it possible to run into a low cost metal supplier that doesn't offer the proper metal warranties or paint warranties um, or their warranties might be poor or misleading? If you're looking to get a new metal roof on your house or your building and things like that, you're obviously looking at multiple options. Um, and I think you're going to see a lot of those options uh, that are going to be the same with, you know, more reputable companies, people that have been placed a long time. I think something to watch out for is if you see something that might seem a little off the wall that nobody else is offering, quite honestly. A lot of the steel warranties and things like that are backed by the steel mills that make the steel compared to say a warranty that's offered by maybe just the company itself to where you don't have uh, that big backing that you would say behind a steel mill backing up their product versus maybe somebody using a warranty type situation as a selling point. Now, when it comes to actually fabricating panels, not all coils and sheets are created equal. You know, there can be potential issues when it comes to forming metal. Tell me about that. Yeah, you know, you could have, you know, poor quality equipment uh, that, that actually slit the material. So if you got a, a bad edge, a bad edge could be like a wavy edge. It could be uh, a significant burr on the edge. And that could cause issues when you're roll forming. If you're talking about a, a lower quality, cheaper type of coil, kind of what you'd, you'd probably experience is like some center buckles. Even if you have a clean slit edge, you could have some camber in the coil. Um, you know, these are all kind of shape issues that, that you could have, you know, ended up with some secondary material. Uh, you could end up with quote unquote, the wrong material. You know, we, we talked a little bit earlier about, you know, the right material for the right application. So if you have a one size fits all metal coil supplier and, you know, the gutter coil is the same as the roofing coil, you know, it's probably a little bit softer of a steel, not ideal for metal roof fabrication. Odds are there's no available real engineering for that system, um, as well as you could have more potential shape issues. And then conversely, with the harder steel, you know, you might be okay with, you know, a profile that doesn't have a lot of bends in it, i.e., you know, like a, a fastener flange type panel. You don't really have the sharp bends that an inch and three quarter snap lock has. Definitely not the sharp bends that you're going to have with a mechanical seam. So if you're using a harder type metal, you can probably get away with using, uh, you know, grade 80 on a fastener flange. Don't recommend it really whatsoever. Any grade 80 on standing seam, but you probably won't be able to do any even fabrication or installation with a grade 80 type metal on any sort of inch and three quarter snap locks, any sort of the, the mechanical locks, just because they're too tight as seams. You're either going to fracture the metal or you're going to, you know, put a lot of undue stress on your, your fabrication, your forming equipment, whether it's your, uh, your shear, your brake, your uh, roll former, or even your seaming machine. So tell me about the support that a supplier may or may not offer depending on, you know, the price of their material. So, you know, we call them value add services here at Sheffield. Um, if you want somebody to just sell you a roof panel and that's all you need, you know exactly what you want and you're good, you know, maybe those aren't important to you. If you think you know what you want and you ask somebody that's knowledgeable about metal roofing and, you know, they might be able to tell you that that's not the route you want to go and that this might be more applicable for your situation. It might even save you a couple of dollars in the long run. But that's really the difference, I think, when it comes to, you know, the difference you get with people that, you know, have the knowledge and are able to provide the support services compared to people that are just out there selling coil or selling panels. You know, there's, I think there's a place for both of them in the industry. It depends on which, what, what type of service you're looking for. You know, we're, we're talking about value added services. So Jeff, I kind of look at it like you can buy coil from anybody, but you know, to your point, is this the right metal for the application or are you just buying metal? And oftentimes, you know, the transaction isn't over when you cut a PO. Oftentimes you're gonna need a finish warranty. Oftentimes you're gonna need access to a weather type warranty or, or, you know, technical support for engineering. So even in the situations where you don't, you kind of know what you're getting and you kind of have a certain comfort level as well as your rep and the company that you're working with really knows what they're, what they're talking about. And, you know, the beautiful thing about our world and, and the world we play in, 
you know, we've got a lot of awesome competitors that are very knowledgeable. You know, we feel like we're very knowledgeable, but we're in an industry, in the metal roofing industry, there's a lot of passionate people. And if you come across somebody that really doesn't know what they're doing or what they're selling, and I'm not going to say run for the hills, but, you know, to me, there's probably a lot better options out there because there are a lot of people that really care and know what they're talking about in our world. Yeah, just just an example of that, you know, it's it's one that comes up all the time is the wrong panel for the wrong slope. Something that little can really affect your final installation and how your roof performs. Another thing that we see when it comes to low cost metal suppliers is, you know, the sheet and coil sales might not be their bread and butter as a company. Talk to me about that and how that might affect decisions. One, I think that if you are not a metal roofer, as in like, that's not your primary goal, you might not know how to properly estimate the roof that you're looking at selling or installing. Again, with it not being your full-time job and that's what you do, um, the installation details that you quote or install might not be appropriate. Metal roofing is a craft and the guys that do a full-time are craftsmen, you know, the guys that do it well. Standing seam roofing is even more of a craft. I think the experience that you get, you know, even if you're new, but starting off under people that are craftsmen uh, really make the difference between whether it's something you do full time or part time. And we talked a lot about the problems of low cost metal sheet and coil. Is there a time when, you know, that low cost might not be a bad thing, depending on who you're getting it from? Sure. You know, I think there's there's always a match for you know, coil suppliers who come across some excess prime or secondary and, you know, might be the right project for it. Uh, additionally, having aged inventory, um, you know, you might find a supplier that might be willing to uh, make a deal on it. Additionally, you could have an oddball cut thing. So, you know, your standard sheet size is, you know, four by 10, you know, the machine might have been out of tolerance and making, you know, nine foot 10 sheets that day you know, you're typically not going to sell those as prime 10 foot sheets because that's not a 10 foot sheet. So, you know, if a supplier saying, hey, I'll knock off, you know, five bucks a sheet, you know, just for your troubles, you know, it might affect your layout on this roof, but I'll give you a deal for it. You know, you might see things like that, but, you know, by and large, you know, you're, you're really going to be limited to, to really special situations where it just has to be the right fit. It's the right situation for the end user and the contractor. So with the problems that we've talked about, choosing the low cost metal sheet and coil supplier may end up costing you more money in the long run, depending on the quality of materials, the value added options that you may or may not get with that supplier. So make sure you understand where your material is coming from and that you are comfortable with your supplier. Comment down below if you have any questions, love to answer them. Subscribe here to the Metal Roofing channel for more videos. As always, I'm Thad Barnett and we'll catch you next time.